All right, good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. Uh, the webinar series is a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on pressing issues of the day. The Authors Forum is a series within the On the Park Bench webinars that discusses recently published books by urbanists of, or of interest to urbanists. The producer is Diro Tadani, architect and urbanist. Today's On the Park Bench webinar is an Authors Forum. It is The Urban Fix, Resilient Cities in the War Against Climate Change, Heat Islands and Overpopulation. Uh, we are joined by author Doug Kilba and will later be joined by of uh, CNU co-founder Peter Calthorpe. If you have thoughts on On the Park Bench, you can share those at www.tinyurl.com slash otpbfeedback. And we also have some upcoming webinars. On Tuesday, March 1st, we have Architecture and the Edges of Public Space that will discuss the role of architecture in shaping public space and the lessons for policies and practice. And then on Tuesday, March 8th, we have new urban development in Oklahoma in Phil and Newtown with CNU 30 upcoming in Oklahoma City on March 23rd through March 26th. We take a sneak peek at two communities that are really worth seeing. And you can register for both of these at cnu.org. And also we have upcoming our annual Congress, CNU 30, Oklahoma City. This will be CNU's first in-person Congress since 2019. Uh, you can learn how a, commitment, a clear commitment to urbanism, careful financing and resident engagement can spark a city's renaissance. You can learn more and register at cnu.org slash cnu30. And while you are there, you can also join or renew your membership uh, become a current member and you can save up to $200 off your CNU 30 registration. Check out your membership status today at members.cnu.org slash memberships. So today we are joined by Professor Doug Kilba. He is the author of The Urban Fix. Uh, he received a BA magna cum laude and a master's of architecture from Princeton University and then led Cowball and Lee from 1977 to 1985, an architecture firm that won 15 design awards and competitions. While architecture chair at the University of Washington, he was principal in Cowball, Calthorpe and Associates. At the University of Michigan, Doug served as Dean of Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning between 1998 and 2008, then as vice president of design and planning for a large development company in Dubai working on major projects in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Europe, and Africa. Returning to full-time teaching in 2010, he was awarded the 2016 Topaz Medallion for Excellence in Architectural Education. He authored or edited numerous books, most recently, The Urban Fix. The interviewer today is Peter Calthorpe. In 1983, Peter founded the award-winning firm of Calthorpe Associates, devoted to sustainable urban design and planning globally. Throughout his career in urban designing and architecture, he has been a pioneer of innovative approaches to urban revitalization, community planning, and regional design. For his contribution to redefining the models of urban and suburban growth, he was awarded Urban Land Institute's prestigious J.C. Nichols Prize for Visionaries in Urban Development in 2006. He is one of the founders and the first board president of Congress for the New Urbanism. His work has expanded to include major projects in urban, new town, and suburban settings within the United States and abroad. And I am Lauren Mayer. I am the communications manager here at Congress for the New Urbanism. This book is The Urban Fix. Cities are one of the motivators to climate, global climate change. The rapid speed at which urban centers use large amounts of resources adds to the global crisis and can lead to extreme local heat. 
Doug Kilbaugh, book, Kilbaugh's book, The Urban Fix, Resilient Cities and the War Against Climate Change, Heat Islands and Overpopulation, addresses how urban design, planning and policies can counter the threats of climate change and urban heat islands. Helping cities take full advantage of their inherent advantages and new technologies to catalyze social, cultural and physical solutions to combat the epic he faces. This book is invaluable to anyone searching for a better understanding of the impact of resilient cities in the monumental and urgent fight against climate change and provides the tools to do so. Please note that Doug will be providing a discount code for this book at the end of his presentation. So now I'm going to turn it over to Doug, who is going to give a brief presentation, followed by a discussion with Peter and a Q&A from the audience. Uh, please remember to use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask your questions as they occur to you. All right, Doug, and now I'm going to share your presentation. Okay, take it away. So Lauren, can you get my... I may be saying, I may have to say forward. We'll see if I can forward it. Anyway, I, okay. Uh, that's, if you could go back about three slides, four slides. Right there, okay, well, that's the title of the lecture in the book. Forward, next. So human settlements are just as natural as a colony of prairie dogs or a bed of oysters or a hive of bees. People watching in cities is as much about nature as bird watching in the countryside. Unlike organisms like animals, plants, or corporations that have to die, they don't live forever, ecosystems don't have such a finite lifespan, nor do cities. Think how old Cairo, Rome, and Jerusalem are. Next. Oh, I can do that maybe, all right. Um, they have huge footprints though. Eco footprints, carbon footprints, uh, you name it. So how can they be green in ecological terms? You're gonna have to go next, I can't do it. Well, look at this important slide. If you look at the top, 2010, 12 years ago, uh, this is energy consumption. Urban is the green, 66%, rural, 34%. By 2040, they're estimating that about 80% of all the world's CO2 will be produced in cities versus the countryside, which was about 20%. Uh, they're projected to get worse next. <clears throat> so this is a term I coined, the environmental paradox of cities, next. And uh, this is it in a nutshell. This is uh, CO, carbon dioxide emissions per person. It happens to be Toronto. So red is the suburbs and rural hinterland, the low density areas. Purple, I'm sorry, red, the upper bar is low density areas and the lower bar is high density areas. So red is transportation, which is obviously much higher in low density areas, but building operations are also more expensive because freestanding buildings take more energy to heat, light and cool. And then green is the materials, the energy goes into the materials to actually build those buildings. There's more in the bigger buildings in suburbia. Whereas high density areas, a lot less transportation. And because you share walls, floors, and ceilings, you need less energy to heat and cool your unit. And lastly, more compact construction, higher density development means you, there's less energy in the materials. Next. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about the urban heat island which results from the buildup of sensible heat, that's heat you can feel from hot tailpipes and from chimneys and from dark surfaces that get heated up by the sun. It's nothing to do with global climate change. It has nothing to do with the greenhouse effect. 
It's a local phenomenon. Next. Next, okay. So there's a double whammy living downtown. You have the greenhouse effect that's affecting the whole planet, and then you have the heat island effect on top of it. Next. So these, these impacts of heat are, are multi, multiple, you have direct impacts, but you have more vector-borne disease, it's tougher on children and pregnant mothers, it does affect mental health, lowers worker productivity, and even affects nutrition, next. Next. Look at the surface temperatures across this metro area. Downtown on the left, inner city neighborhoods, then outer city neighborhoods and suburbia in the countryside. Dramatic difference. Here, is it, here it is in terms of temperature, urban being red, shows how cities are getting hotter since 1960 here. And uh, how the countryside's getting hotter too, but there's still a delta. Thanks, next. Look at the Philadelphia street here. Uh, Philly's getting hotter and wetter due to climate change. Some neighborhoods can be as much as 20, 22 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than others for lack of trees and a lot of dark surfaces. If you look here, on the far left, it's 84 under that tree. And then in the middle, it's 116 in, or 17 in the street, 112 on the stoop, et cetera. Next. So darker pavements on the left don't reflect much light, that's sunlight, whereas lighter pavements do. That's a big difference, four to one. Next. So I'm gonna go through four strategies to reduce and prevent heat islands. One is generally referred to as albedo enhancement, which simply means lighter color roofs, pavement and walls. Next. So one thing is we gotta make roads less wide. This is a street in Ann Arbor I used to bike on regularly and First of all, they could depave the parking strips and put gravel in, but this is a quiet little neighborhood, a lot of asphalt that's absorbing heat, plus using a lot of resources to build and maintain. Next. So white paint, you can't beat that. The simplest passive solar technology, uh, it reflects four times as much as a, as a typical dark gray black roof. Um, this is really good news. Next. Now, another way is to have less heat from tailpipes, chimneys, and air conditioners, as I mentioned. Um, and this has a lot to do with having better air conditioners because they're spreading like wildfire over the planet. Um, we have to get better at making air conditioners next, which is not easy. Uh, and then we need a lot more curb space for all sorts of ride hailing and ride sharing services to drop off, pick up passengers, a little bit like an airport. Uh, Peter's a real expert on this. Next. And less air conditioning, as I said, because air conditioning pumps actually hot, sensibly hot air into the street. Um, so to deal with heat waves made more frequent by climate change, the number of AC units is expected to more than triple worldwide by 2050. As well as guzzling huge amounts of electricity, AC units contain refrigerants that are very potent greenhouse gases. These refrigerants, in fact, are the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in every country on the planet. Next. I think this is Singapore we're looking at here. Next. 
Lauren, next. Thirdly, we need to open up street and building canyons to ventilating winds next. So here's a here's an urban section, might be called Street Canyon. You've obviously got the lower the pavement and sidewalk on the lower level, and then you got the vertical walls on either side and the rooftops uh, of those buildings next. So it's a heat trap. He he's the heat builds up to the extent that they're actually tearing down some buildings in Beijing, where I've been re not that long ago, to get more air uh, moving through. Now, they're, they're trying to get rid of air pollution, which is pretty bad, but the truth of the matter is it's also helping on climate change and getting rid of hot air. Next, tearing down buildings. And lastly, and maybe most relevant, cool microclimates basically trees uh, to shade, filter, cool the air and doing lots of other wonderful things. Next. Uh, this is a list of things that trees do that are beneficial that I've developed over the years with my students. I'm not gonna go through them but you can see they do a lot more than sequester carbon dioxide i mean they and produce oxygen and provide shade they do lots of other wonderful things they're great assets great allies great multitaskers next here's some trees from savannah george on the right taken at the cnu about 10 years down 10 years ago uh, and I believe that's uh, Central Park on the right. Yeah, it is. James Lovelock. Earth may be alive, but alive like a tree. A tree that quietly exists, never moving except to sway in the wind, yet endless conversing with the sunlight and soil. Next. Look at the difference between the city in Argentina and San Juan, Puerto Rico. You can imagine how much cooler the one is on the left. Next. Here's some trees in um, Saigon where Peter spends a lot of time, really big trees on the left. And that's uh, in uh, Buenos Aires on the right. Actually, that's the cover photo from my book. Uh, urban, uh, urban trees actually grow bigger than a forest because they have less competition um, and their shade does all sorts of things, uh, mitigating climate change much more effectively in cities the non-urban trees in the countryside. Trees in Metro Chicago provide an estimated $350 million of value in annual carbon storage. The estimated value of its street forest, its canopy is over 50 billion. And a major insect infestation is a serious issue um, on many levels. Next. These are real estate values in Portland, Oregon. It's a Columbia River on the upper, on, on the top. And it just shows that if you have a, a tree in front of your house, you add value to its sales price. Now this is an old number. It's probably two, two or three times that now the difference if you have a tree and, and if you're on a tree lined street with lots of trees, your the values goes up well over $50,000 now. Next. So we have to plant trees. Uh, and this is a search where if you actually plant trees, uh, you get some uh, free searches on the web. Next, Ecosia. So here's a, here's a little review of why cities are so important. I mean, obviously we have to deal with climate change. It's the greatest challenge ever to face humanity. And we all know about mixed use walkable transit serve cities that CNU has championed. Uh, they have lower carbon footprints per capita, and the bigger the city, the denser the city, the better. Cities also dampen birth rates, which lowers humanity's total carbon footprint. This, we don't have time to talk about that today, but people who move from the countryside to the city have fewer kids. As urban eons get hotter, they deter people from moving to or staying in cities. This is a problem. Uh, we want people in cities for the reasons stated above. Addressing, and this is 
good news. Addressing ur urban eons simultaneously addresses car, uh, climate change. And I argue in my book, because urban eons are more immediate and a more manageable problem than climate change, which is a 50 to 100 year problem versus a five to 10 year problem. They can be, they can more compellingly motivate people to act on climate change. So cities may be our last best hope. I think I have another slide or two. Next. Yeah, if you, uh, when you go to Rattledge Press online, which is part of Taylor and Francis, if you use capital SOC 19 at checkout, you'll get a 20% discount on the book. I am done, Peter. I don't see. I'm here. I'm here. Well, um, I'd like to start off by trying okay. to explain what you're talking about a little bit. The book is one of the most comprehensive looks at the, um, you know, the ergonomics of cities in terms of the environment that I've ever looked through. It's a very comprehensive approach. And so actually the heat island component of it is just one small Piece. So it's a great uh, summation of a lot of what we think of as urban urbanism. I wanted to actually thank you. Thank you. What? Okay. I wanted to direct our dis uh, our discussion a little more into a, a broader range because I, I think there's been some debate now about uh, adaptation versus um, conservation and renewables. Uh, and I think this is actually a third major uh, issue. But in the adaptation range, uh, th there's no question in my mind that we have to do all of them. I've been doing a master plan for Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, and, you know, about a third of the city is already underwater. And uh, as they plan forward looking, they're, they're inhabiting more and more lowland. So there's a sensibility about where development should happen, which is another uh, layer to what urbanism and new urbanism always talked about, which is w where, not what, but where should we grow? And I think transit-oriented development uh, began to think about that at a regional scale. We had endless debates about urban growth boundaries. Um, so the where of cities, uh, I think, is an important discussion item. Um, Adaptation in what you're talking about in terms of heat island is is terribly important. Uh, it you know the heat will kill people uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, and benign solutions, I always call them the passive solutions: trees, urbanism. These are the things that reduce the problem before uh, it, it gets to the stage that it has to be mitigated. Um, but I, I want to throw one other in here that may be a, out, out of left field for you and maybe the rest of this crowd, which is I'm now of the mind that at the same time that we reduce carbon emissions with urbanism in all the ways that we, you've documented in your book, um, I think we're gonna have, we're in for geoengineering. Uh, and the same mentality of saying albedo matters, reflectivity matters in cities, actually it matters at the scale of the planet. And I think only one of the only one of the ways that we're going to see our way through this mess is by actually injecting aerosols uh, into a higher atmosphere environments and reflecting sunlight before it actually gets to the planet. So there's an interesting matrix of issues here. Um, maybe you want to comment on any and all of this. Uh, it, well, you know, geoengineering uh, will play a role. I don't think we're quite ready for it for a couple of reasons. A, we have a lot more <clears throat> mitigation and adaptation we can do, but it's gonna happen and we will be seeding the skies. The problem is geopolitical. You know, a country that puts up aerosols may heavily affect uh, another country's climate that doesn't have a problem and vice versa. So, because it's hard to predict where these clouds will end up and how white they'll be and so on is geopolitically probably going to be a nightmare, but we'll probably have to do it anyway. You know, what's fascinating about your thought there is that 
um, one of its benefits and problems is that, you know, Elon Musk himself could just go and do it. I mean, it doesn't even take a country. Uh, it's actually an incredibly- Yeah, that's right. Thing. You're and, absolutely right. I mean, uh, there was, at one point, they dumped some uh, sulfide in the waters off Southern Alaska or British Columbia. And, you know, the local Indians, uh, Native Americans were upset because it affected their fishing. And it's, whether it's in the ocean or the air, it's, it's geopolitically complex. Yes, and so is climate change. <laughs> We're uncertain exactly what its manifestation is gonna be in which climate zones and which uh, ecologies, but we are certain that it's gonna have an impact on every single one. Yep. No, climate change is pervasive. As I described it, it's the greatest challenge ever to face humanity, much bigger than World War II because it's much more pervasive uh, and much more interconnected to lots of other issues. Um, it's gonna be a, a difficult ride for our children and frankly, a horrible ride for our grandchildren. Yeah. But let's go back to your and my roots, which was passive solar uh, in buildings. And you know, as urbanists, we tend to maybe ignore a little past the incredible strides that architects have made with energy efficiency in buildings. And the degree to which that energy efficiency ends up not being about mechanics, it ends up being about daylight, natural ventilation, uh, buildings with intelligent uh, facades that shade in appropriate ways, uh, a whole range of things that make the built environment better. I think the same can be said of of adaptation and mitigation in cities. Um, and I absolutely oh, yeah. Excuse me. I mean, Peter and I go back to the passive solar movement. We met in the mid 70s because we were both doing some of the early pioneering work in that field as we later did for the new urbanist movement. Um, been involved in the, on the front edge of two very important movements. Um, we were doing passive solar houses. I did a so-called Trom Wall in Princeton, New Jersey, the first one outside of Europe. And it was in a hundred books and magazines and it launched my career and a Passive Solar launched Peter's career, which is even more illustrious than mine. And so I, we owe a lot to those roots and we learned passive is an important word. It wasn't about putting solar collectors or PV collectors on the roof. It was about using, as Peter said, fenestration, dealing with glass that faces east, west, and, and south in different ways, and with overhangs and shade, and with mass, thermal mass, whether it's in a greenhouse or a trom wall or a direct gain building to store the heat, because the big thing is the flywheel. You got to get the heat from the daytime into the night when you're asleep. So you need some thermal time lag and yeah, you know, you need thermal mass for that. Um, anyway, it was a very interesting episode that ended for me when I moved to Seattle because climate was not such a big deal in Seattle as, as in New Jersey. Um, but the passive solar movement is, well, it's not a movement anymore, but I mean, go to this American Southwest, which is full of passive solar houses. Colorado. Uh, you know, I don't think it's, it's simply about passive solar buildings. Now with LEED and, uh, you know, for example, Title 24 in the state of California, which sets energy performance standards, all of a sudden architecture has gotten a lot more intelligent. Um, and I think yes. more urban potentially than ever before. And I, I think this idea of Passive versus active, even though passive is a bizarre word. You know, one approach seeks to reduce the problem before it emerges, i.e., you know, conserves energy before you have to build a collector um, by being more in tune with the environment. Uh, and, and urbanism is in that same category. It just reduces VMT before you get to the question of, 
is it electrical or not? And where is the electricity coming from? Um, you know, so I think we've always been in this, uh, you know, mutual world with that fundamental strategy. Um, but, you know, the other thing your book does is- Which is why new urbanism. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing your book does is it, it, it's pretty metric heavy. And I, I know that there's a, a, an endless debate about aesthetics versus and, and uh, the kind of, so what you can measure and what you can't measure. Um, I've always, you know, I've always been a both and kind of person, which is that you need to do both if you're advocating for urbanism or if you're advocating for uh, climate change mitigation, or even if you're advocating for adaptation strategies. So um, can you say a little more about um, the depth of research that you went to in this was kind of extraordinary. Yeah, I know. I, I, I had a, a sabbatical at Cambridge University. And I spent six months researching the book and a, a year and a half writing it. It's a lot of work. I find the metrics are important. Um, uh, I think, though, the bigger issue is, is as you describe it. And I, what I like about new urbanism is that it is dealing with this bigger issue of urbanism and land use and and density. I mean, after all, dense places, as that chart showed in my slide presentation, it's less energy to heat, cool, and light, less energy to build, and then less energy to move around in vehicles. There's more walking, biking, and transit use. Uh, so new urbanism is on the right side of the equation in many ways. Um, and I'm proud to be part of it. You know, it's fascinating to me. Sometimes metrics uh, can be incredibly powerful. Uh, I'm thinking of one example, which is in China, after a lot of work thinking about their, you know, shifting away from cars and towards transit, walking and biking, uh, um, there ended up to be a very simple policy, which was each city has to designate its mode split and then plan its urban design to achieve it and um, structure its investments to achieve it. So when a city a priori says, we're going to have a 40% mode split to transit, we're going to have a 20% mode split to cars, that completely changes not only the form of the city, but the nature of the investments that are made, um, you know, and so I think that actually setting standards like that can be very, very powerful. And likewise, what you were talking about with trees, um, you know, stipulating based on climate zone, exactly what percent of the city needs to be in tree canopy is actually a, a standard that's being set in many places across the planet. Uh, we all know standards are aspirational and goal oriented, but if we don't have those standards, we don't have those aspirations, uh, I don't think people really know what direction to move in. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We need standards. I'm not a big fan of LEED. I prefer Ed Masria's AIA 2030 when it comes to buildings. But you mentioned the other day when we were chanting, Peter, that motorbikes in uh, Ho Chi Minh City are now what the single biggest saver of carbon? No, 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 no. Uh, motorcycles are ninety percent of trips, um, and uh, the West is trying to get uh, the city to go into debt to build metro as an alternative. And uh, our strategy completely turned that on its head. Said, let's electrify those motorcycles. And by the way, if you don't, if you dedicate a lane or a street you actually have a higher capacity than BRT or light rail in one lane of, of electric bikes than you do in one lane of uh, light rail or B BRT. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. It's, and it's, you know, I, I've been to nobody, uh, yeah. to... nobody really believed it. And then we did, you know, HDR did all the uh, engineering calcs and yes, but this is, you know, intuitively so we all know bicycles are incredibly efficient in space and energy. Uh, and they are, you know, an intrinsic part of great urban environments. 
So the fact that we now can electrify those bikes and more people can ride them and uh, you know they can get farther more in a more comfortable manner means that it can play a much bigger role, which then means that maybe bike lanes need to turn into e-bike streets and we can just um, grid our cities with auto-free environments because there really is a viable alternative. You know, I have an e-bike in Seattle and I love it. It's also quiet. Uh, I've been to the streets of Ho Chi Minh City and, and, and uh, uh, Hanoi and they were very noisy because of all those motor, you oh, know. Oh yeah, and internal, terrible air pollution. It's terrible. get quieter. Yeah, but you know, China actually converted from uh, internal combustion engine motorcycles to electric in three years now. This is the value of an authoritarian government, I guess, but uh, it's very easy to do. And quite frankly, the technology is exploding. Uh, it, you know, so this is one of these pieces of technology that I think are gonna really change the nature of our cities pretty dramatically. And so here I am, the guy who advocated for transit and transit-oriented development, literally saying, well, maybe two wheels is better, no matter how, you know, than, <laughs> some collective form of shared transit. I got into a lot of trouble for that, by the way, with the World Bank. They really got pissed off. <laughs> well, my e-bike is great. It deals with the hills of Seattle very well. It doesn't have a high top speed, about 22 or three miles an hour coming downhill, about 12 or 13 going up a steep hill. But it's a pleasure uh, to move through the city that way. It's a nice speed. I do a lot of biking on, on a regular bicycle too, but that's more for pleasure. Whereas the e-bike I do shopping on and things, you know. Do you realize that when you uh, calculate in first mile, last mile and uh, stops that a uh, BRT system averages 18 miles an hour? Huh. So, you know. That's about the same as an e-bike average, yeah. So there's, there's not a lot of difference there. Mm. And I don't know about the danger element. I mean, of course, I wear a helmet, recreational biking and e-biking. Uh, but I think it'll get safer as they start to have dedicated lanes more and more, and they're more two-wheeled vehicles. It'll get better. There's well, still the quite a few bicycle deaths in America. That's because we don't have dedicated space for them. I mean, when you look to the Dutch, uh, you know, and, and those cities that are really invested in, in bike transit, um, you know, the, the, the accident rates are way down. Right, so, and they don't even wear helmets in, in Amsterdam. Yeah. And they still have very low accident rates. So do we want to let in uh, some of the uh, the audience and, and get a, a bigger dialogue going? Because otherwise we're just going to talk about the old days. <laughs> Who's orchestrating that? Hi again, I am here to help out with the Q&A session. This is just a reminder for any audience participants to uh, submit your questions to the Q&A and we'll be answering them live. So the first question we have is from Stephanie Bothwell. She says, Doug and Peter, tell us how you have seen ex or experienced the environmental message changing over time. What is the carrot in the US versus China, for instance? And then she says, thank you both for doing this presentation. Hello, Stephanie. Um, well, I think we've seen a shift from mitigation to adaptation. And now as Peter says to geoengineering, which is coming in the future. Um, what else did Stephanie wanna know? The shift and- uh, uh, How the environmental message has changed over time. Well, I'll say that- Peter, uh, you can handle that one. Yeah, it's a pretty uh, diverse, you can't actually say the environmental movement anymore. There, 
there are many different layers. There's all the specialists, the people that care about a certain habitat or a certain uh, ecology. Um, there's the Sierra Club, which is really just a smoke screen for NIMBYs. Um, there's NRDC that looks at things in a deep systemic way. So uh, it's pretty diverse. Um, you know, at the, at the positive end, you have groups that are deeply aligned with urbanism and understand that urbanism is the lightest footprint that we could end up with, both in terms of its land and, and energy and uh, environmental impact. Um, you know, but I also realize that we urbanists tend to think about everything in terms of urbanism and we forget, well, you know, one of the biggest impacts on the planet is the way we eat and the way we farm and the percentage of uh, global habitat that's displaced by our eating habits, i.e. mainly beef and uh, non-vegetarian uh, food, you know, and that there is a whole crisis around um, ecologies and habitat and, and the rest of it. And God bless them for shining a light on that issue. And quite frankly, also in terms of climate change, it's the same kind of thing as with cities. You can solve for a more sustainable agricultural systems uh, at the same time that you're absorbing carbon uh, into the soil. So rather than petrochemical fertilizers, more natural systems. So the environmentalists go farther than us in some areas, they become specialists, which uh, tragically, um, many in the built environment become specialists. So uh, same flaws, same, same dangers. Uh, you know, now you have uh, a counter cyclical movement, I think at least in the United States that because of this COVID we, we have, everybody wants to go back to the suburbs. Um, but then again, you know, it's amazing to me that the everybody is always framed as upper middle class, um, households, incomes, e economic capabilities. Uh, there are just too many people in this country that don't even have those kinds of choices, um, but they can have great choices. So the environmental movement is re really too diverse uh, to see, to say, you know, friend or foe. Interesting, um, interesting. You know, I, I, you're right about agriculture and, and American diets. Um, I I don't eat beef anymore, zero beef and no lamb. I have chicken and turkey and, and pork, which is one tenth uh, the amount of energy and water per calorie as beef. Beef is really bad news. Uh, you should all swear off beef. <laughs> Peter, have you sworn off beef? A long time ago. Oh, good. I forget I had heart disease, so I had oh, right, very yeah. Yeah, Beef is bad news. Um, you know, it's interesting that those things that are bad for the planet could also be bad for your body. Yeah, that's a good point. A good point. All I right, try to I sometimes buy that meatless, I mean, what is it? Uh, you know, that vegetarian meat, I sometimes eat that which is quite tasty, I find. Meat burgers and all that. What are they called? Veggie burgers. Um, and we, of course, eat a lot of veggies. Anyway, next. Wonderful. So we have a question from Carlin Vassan, and they are asking, what are your thoughts on how changes in zoning can make our urban environments more sustainable as we develop and redevelop our cities and suburbs? What changes should have the biggest impact as we adapt to climate change? There's a softball if I ever saw one. <laughs> well, I'll take the first swing. I mean, this movement to allow more accessory dwelling units, whether they're attached or detached, whatever, is big all over the country. Uh, I'm happy to say I got the first law passed in Washington State, I don't know, back in the late 80s. Uh, we see more and more, um, uh, you know, ADUs are, are big help. And, you know, they're also allowing two or three on a lot in many cities in America, Portland, Minneapolis, and some others. And 
that's a way to increase density in a very subtle, benign way. And then, of course, there are more and more condos being built and more and more rental units. That's all good. Okay, so maybe we can get some controversy going here. We just passed a law in California for um, fourplex on single family. I'm not a supporter. Uh, I think it just enrages the NIMBYs and does, it will not produce affordable housing in any quantity. Um, you know, in its worst form, it means that developers will move into low income neighborhoods and buy up cheap lots, consolidate them and develop them. Um, its best outcome is trivial, which is upper middle class people at a unit. Uh, they continue to expand their um, their advantage and the, the working class people are completely left out of that picture. They really, they don't have houses that are big enough, uh, lots big enough to do anything with. And furthermore, it's kind of ad hoc. There was a study in California that said that this new law may be, there's 7 million single family lots in California. Only 5% are probable for this kind of redevelopment. We've had ADU, on the law on the books for about five years produced very minimal amount of housing. We have a profound housing crisis that I think the new urbanists ought to get serious about head on because I think we do have the solution. Um, and it's about workforce housing. It's not about upper middle class people who can go to a bank and get financing to do a big renovation, uh, enhancing their property value. It's about building high density housing close to job centers. And there is a big solution, which is strip commercial, which is now more bund land, actually has the capacity. We did a study for, for five county Bay Area and LA County alone. Three million units could enhance and reshape these uh, arterial wastelands into livable places that uh, actually supply housing in a distributed manner through our regions, um, cross cut uh, through communities. So the wealthy communities don't say no and the poor communities have to take the burden. I mean, there's big solutions here. Um, and I actually think that this missing middle thing, uh, it, it, it tragically is kind of a, a sidebar that's really not gonna accomplish much other than, well, what do we have right now in California? We have a ballot initiative to not only um, roll back that law, but also uh, eviscerate the capacity of the state to set housing policy and uh, overcome local nimbyism. Um, so this is a big, big topic. I'm pretty passionate about it now. No, I think, um, I think you're right. I mean. ADUs are not that big numerically, but you know we had one in our house in Seattle before we moved, and there are, there are a lot of them. Now, the real conundrum for me, and maybe Peter can help, there's housing being built everywhere, multifamily housing in Seattle. Everywhere I drive, and I drive a lot delivering flowers for my daughter, and uh, it's just amazing how much construction there is. I am sure supply is exceeding demand. For, for some reason, the supply demand curve isn't working. And I've asked a lot of people, including some very connected people in, in Seattle, why isn't supply and demand working? Peter, do you know why it isn't working? Because the supply is immense, but prices keep going up. Well, you're wrong about the supply. The supply is completely inadequate. Ever Not since in Seattle. Uh, yes, it is. And I have the data, there, Doug. I mean, driving around and having anecdotal impressions is one thing, but actually doing counts of permits is another. I'm sorry. What's going on is since 2008, um, the, you know, which was a good hard stop to suburban sprawl, because really what happened there was that financing behind remote single family dwellings imploded. Uh, and, you know, which was tragically entry level affordable housing. Remember drive till you qualify kind of stuff. 
Um, so work, the workforce was driving farther and farther uh, from their jobs in order to afford cheaper and cheaper subdivisions. And it went to a breaking point. Since that time, there's really been no housing policy or methodology of scale. Now, um, you may see uh, a multifamily here or there, but to do it at a systemic level, uh, you need to get past the NIMBYs. Uh, you need to be able to insert, and we did a study for one arterial in Silicon Valley called El Camino. The, the land on fronting El Camino could, could uh, take care of a quarter million households. I mean, this is at the scale that we can, we can be advocates for. You know, we were advocates for infill and mixed use, but unfortunately that kind of incrementalism in the face of local entitlement processes that take decades now and litigation to get through means that anything that actually makes it through those sieves is so expensive, it's not particularly helpful. So we need as of right, and, uh, and it's gotta be across the board. So cities like Palo Alto, the wealthy cities have to do it as well as the poor cities. Um, and then once you've done that, lo and behold, you've put density into a ribbon that can be easily served by transit. So there's a pretty clean fit. It's a different kind of urbanism. It's not nodal, um, it's, it's not neighborhood focused, it's not uh, TOD focused. Um, it's more, more like a, a set of ribbons, urban ribbons that would uh, re-inhabit what is really wasted land at this point. Now, Peter, your study for El Camino Real from um, San Francisco down through Palo Alto to San Jose is amazing. I, I hope it's actually being realized. Are you starting to see some action? No, no, no. I mean, the problem is the wind is out of the sail well, let's go back because you know we're talking to a pretty sophisticated crowd here who actually knows what happens when you try to get something built or you change an urban environment in a significant way. And we're locked into decades of controversy, financing problems, um, and then ultimately litigation. Uh, so we need state level um, as of right legislation for housing at the same scale that it used to be produced in the suburbs. Um, you know, the suburbs were underwritten, financed and zoned by the feds. Uh, and we need to do the same now if we're gonna deal with the crisis of workforce housing. And once you deal with workforce housing, all of a sudden the price pressure goes off the existing single family stock and the older multifamily stock. And you begin to solve in a, a really profound way the affordable housing crisis. Um, but until we get supply demand balance, until we deal with not you and me and people wealthy enough to have a single family lot and play around with it, but people who are barely are struggling to get through uh, and make ends meet, uh, until we deal with housing for that cohort, um, we're just nail gazing as far as I'm concerned. So we actually have a question from R. Philip Lockwood that dovetails nicely with that. And it is, what advice would you give in regards to balancing affordability with sustainability in economically distressed cities such as Detroit, eco-friendly measures are often seen as reserved for the wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not capable. Well, I think in many ways, um, sustainability and affordability are synonymous. I, I mean, we've all done the numbers, you know, I've done the numbers a hundred times and uh, God bless him, Scott at the Center for Neighborhood Technology made it clear and actually got his nose in the door at HUD uh, some time ago with the idea of the cost of transportation and housing being, you know, fused at the hip. Um, and that's what really killed people. 2008, you know, it's, it's ironic that we let that event happen without articulating the fact that it wasn't just about Wall Street and subprime mortgages. It was about building too much of the wrong stuff in the wrong place. 
And when you have too much of the wrong inventory, what do you do? You discount it. You, 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 you give uh, uh, all sorts of absurd financing techniques to move the inventory that no longer really functions for the household's incomes or lifestyles. So we missed that moment, but I, I, you know, I still would like to go back and harp on it. Uh, but sustainability is about infill. And the big question has always been, because we all know infill is right. The question is where, exactly where? And we can be very, very precise. We've overzoned commercial land. We've overzoned strip commercial, especially now that um, Amazon and the rest of it, we're all online anyway, uh, shopping. Uh, this is a huge inventory, just like the cow pastures used to be at the periphery of our regions where it was an inventory of land for sprawl and subdivisions, this is a huge inventory for urbanism. Um, and if you actually do the numbers, you discover that it's not anecdotal, it's actually systemic. Listen, I've got to go in about three minutes, unfortunately. We're supposed to wrap this up, right? Uh, yes, we are ending here in two minutes and we actually just have one question left. It is from Andreas Duani, um, and it basically is the 15 minute or five minute e-bike shed that encompass that may encompass more than a million people. So what discipline do they then employ to measure the integrated diversity that will be lost with the elimination of the TOD shed? The requisite diversity of income and activity of new urbanism practice could easily replicate that of suburban sprawl. What do we do about that? I'm not sure I, you know, first of all, urban form, I know Andreas understands this, it's not just a subject of one topic like mobility or 15 minute um, uh, mobility on by whatever means. Uh, you know, we were just talking about the affordability crisis. This is the biggest crisis we have. You know, congestion is there, air quality, carbon emissions, but right alongside of it is the fact that the working poor in this country have been neglected. We don't have an American dream that works for them. Quite frankly, it's one of the reasons that you see the populist right moving up in its political might. There's a level of frustration and anger that's extraordinary. We keep thinking about things that work for us uh, and that's the wrong mindset. Um, does does a, a 15 minute e-bike uh, modality mean that we're going to have sprawl? No, because sprawl is also dependent on the economics of low, den low density development, which is not great. Um, once you take into account services and infrastructure, low density, before you even get to construction, low density doesn't really fit the bill for the, the everyday economics of the working class in this country. So uh, those days are over. And uh, there are many forces at work that blend together to create what I think would be pretty extraordinary uh, phase of urbanism that has more to do with infill than anything else. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, looks like we're just after one o'clock. So I will go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, thank you to Doug and Peter and Diru for being a part of this author's forum. We will have a recording of this on the park bench webinar available tomorrow. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Peter. Right. And uh, thanks everybody. Rob and you know, everybody at CNU. See you in Oklahoma City. All right. Goodbye, all. Ciao.